Thank you. Um, again, thank you to the program directors for this, uh, Lee, Kyle, Lionel, really an honor to be here. Uh, I'm an Army orthopedic surgeon. I'm an orthopedic spine. Um, I'm currently the program director there. I have no relevant disclosures. Uh, I still do treat adult and pediatric patients. I have a passion for um, spinal deformity. Uh, one disclosure I have is I uh, didn't train here at UCSF, but I trained at WashU, and here's just a throwback. Um, here is me and Lionel and Jamal, who's also here. Um, it's weird because uh, I mean we all have more white hairs. This is about nine years ago. Uh, Lionel, I mean, I have less hair, and Lionel now has more hair, which is reverse <laughs> aging. So, uh, so yeah, this is us. We had a really great time, learned a lot during that year. So um, I'll just go over some things specifically about high-grade spondylolisthesis because I think that's a little bit more of a um, – topic that we can discuss. So we'll go over some controversies, surgical considerations, and case examples. Uh, so what are some uh, things that are not controversies? So um, the reason that high-grade spondylolisthesis is, uh, has some uh, issues with how to determine treatment is because it's relatively uncommon. I think we get an x-ray like this of one of our patients in clinic. Uh, we're thinking that we may uh, be offering this patient surgery. Uh, there's limited studies and that they're relatively low level of evidence. Um, and not a lot of comparative studies. And ultimately, when we do see patients that are symptomatic, either with a lot of uh, pain, either in their back or radicular symptoms, uh, these are patients we are talking about uh, offering surgery. And the optimal surgical technique is controversial just because um, this is a difficult problem. So this is a, a long-term follow-up study out of Iowa by Dr. Weinstein. Um, so uh, this had 11 patients who were treated non-surgically, 18-year follow-up. And actually, five of those 11 patients ended up being manual laborers. And uh, in their study, they wrote that these patients led surprisingly active lives. Uh, and of the patients they treated surgically, uh, 27 with inside two fusions, 24-year follow-up. But the main difference, and based on these studies that came out in the 1980s, this is sort of their patient-reported outcomes. They found that 66% uh, of the patients who had surgery didn't have any pain or symptoms at final follow-up versus uh, about 36% in the non-op non group. So some of the things that are also may not be controversies are um, you know, the use of instrumentation. We know that uh, for something with a high amount of sheer force that uh, providing uh, patients with uh, instrumentation does increase their fusion rates uh, and decreases the post-operative slip progression. And the patients with uninstrumented fusions uh, often have a high uh, fusion failure rate. And we don't have to use a cast or some type of brace after surgery. Um, for these uh, patients who often have some type of ismic spondylolisthesis, um, we uh, understand that circumferential fusion is probably the best option uh, to get a fusion, and whether you do this from an anterior-posterior approach. Uh, so it's something we'll talk about, uh, and then fusion levels. So um, some of the mantra has been that, you know, some of these high-grade spondies, you have to go to the ilium, um, and then trying to decide your upper instrument and vertebra, whether you can instrument L5 based on the fact that a lot of these L5 pedicles are very dysplastic and deep-seated within the pelvis, and whether you routinely go up to L4. In some cases, I think in the past, routinely we're even going higher up in the lumbar spine. Uh, the other controversy is uh, do you perform a decompression? So obviously a patient who has neurologic presenting with neurologic symptoms, radiculopathy, um, yeah, you're going to offer that patient a decompression. Uh, but there was some thought that if you're going to do a reduction maneuver that you would need to do a decompression as well. And this study by Dr. Rusley out of France uh, um, wanted to kind of counter that. He actually did reduction maneuvers and didn't do decompressions and found that his neurologic complication rate was similar to historical rates and in terms of persistent motor deficits was also similar to historical data. So he advocated that you really don't need to do decompression even if you are doing a reduction maneuver. In terms of reduction, we looked at, uh, you want to look at slip translation versus slip angle. I think we understand that slip angle and our sagittal parameters in terms of the recreation of lordosis, uh, going from a kyphotic deformity to uh, achieving some type of lordosis is probably the more important. Um, the down, downsides of doing some type of reduction, especially a translational reduction, is that you have an increased risk or presumed risk of increased uh, neurologic deficit postoperatively. But we have some uh, uh, systematic reviews, both out of JBGS and more recently out of European Spine Journal, that there actually isn't an increased risk of neurologic deficits when you do a reduction maneuver. Uh, other things is that it can be technically challenging. Uh, certainly, you have to get a screw into L5, which uh, can uh, be very difficult in someone who has a very high sacral slope or very deep seated, you know, grade four. Uh, and certainly um, not really possible usually with spinal optosis. 
Uh, and then when you're doing the reduction maneuver, you do risk losing your fixation or having some loss of fixation strength based on the amount of um, load you're putting on those screws. Certainly the benefits is that if you can reduce a grade three or four to a grade two or even a grade one, that you can place an inner body fusion device, uh, do your fusion through the inner, uh, inner vertebral space, and this is a better um, fusion environment with compression, and then certainly better improvement of your lumbosacral parameters and recreational lordosis through that disc space. Um, so um, what has actually been shown or what's the data about, you know, patients who have in situ fusion? So this is uh, studies out of Sweden. They provided two studies, one 2014, one 2018. And uh, they looked at patients that they did in situ fusions, uninstrumented in situ fusions. About seven or eight of them had some Harrington instrumentation that were uh, done. Uh, this patient here had 24 years follow-up. Um, you can see that they just did uh, in situ fusion. And uh, they did it mostly, they had 90% follow-up, which was amazing for about 40 patients. Um, they did telephone interviews and determined SF36, and just trying to guess, you know, which of these squares versus the triangles were the patients who uh, had in situ fusion versus uh, they assessed versus the normal population of Sweden. So the squares are actually the patients who had in situ fusion in terms of their SF36 components versus the normal population of Sweden. So there is no statistical difference, but they found that patients who ended up having um, just no real reduction in their sagittal parameters fused in situ, they ended up having similar functional scores compared to the normal population who've, who've never had surgery before or a spinal deformity. Um, so going on to some other um, uh, techniques. So this is probably the most uh, advanced technique or the most complex uh, technique. This is uh, uh, reported by uh, Dr. Gaines. Uh, so he reported 30 cases over a 25-year career. So this is for spondyl optosis. He did a two-stage procedure. He went first to the anterior, did a vertebrectomy. Stage two, went to the back, did a fixation and then reduction. Um, uh, almost 90% of his patients had motor deficits after surgery. Uh, but he reported that at long-term follow-up two years at, at two years that uh, only one of those patients had a permanent motor deficit, um, but a lot of these patients, uh, pretty much all the patients had some type of motor deficit. Uh, this is another technique uh, first described in 1982 by Dr. Bowman. This is something we'll talk about more in our case examples. Uh, so he did an all posterior approach, two cases. You can see he did a sacral dome uh, osteotomy just for his, part of his decompression, and then used a, a fibular autograph to do a, basically a bone dial from the back. And this is before the advent of uh, posterior fixation. So there's just some images that come out of a, a Joust article that describes this, but you can see you do a shans pin or some type of a pin that goes from posterior to anterior. You do have to retract the thecal sac after you've done a wide decompression, gill laminectomy, uh, and then you use some type of cannulated reamer to um, place uh, uh, either some type of bone dowel, and as we'll get into, uh, you can place other types of implants. Um, so no good spinal deformity talk is not is uh, good without having some type of reference to a UCSF paper. So uh, we have a UCSF paper here with our uh, esteemed authors. Uh, and you can see here they describe nine cases where they did uh, basically a partial reduction uh, and then transsacral fixation. This is one of the first descriptions of where you just take the sacral screw and you advance it into the L5 body. And they had good outcomes. One of their main issues was, uh, as you would imagine, uh, in this area of bone graft was they were using cortical allograft and uh, problems with fusion across that disc base um, and uh, fractures of the graft. This is also another study, um, just a few patients out of the WashU group. Um, and you can see that they did an anterior approach and essentially a modified speed procedure where they just uh, did a uh, allograft from the front. Uh, and the main problem with, in that study was also fracturing of that fibular allograft. And so uh, Dr. Sasso of Indiana, he kind of advanced that even more and he basically did bilateral. So he put bilateral allografts in. The problem is that these are obviously, uh, the force is in a shear force and these can, um, when, once they do fracture, you, you risk a non-union across that space. Uh, other sort of uh, ways that you can change this is you can start using metal implants, which um, are probably uh, less uh, um, likely to fracture. Uh, this is from an anterior approach, a threaded cage, and then here just out of Italy, something all from the back, uh, a compression screw. And this is just another study out of France that looked at these transsacral screws, sort of another early description of it. They didn't use any type of uh, uh, kind of dowel that went across there, they just got a fusion by putting the screws across um, the space. So you can see here on the left is um, you know, post-op and then uh, 
final follow-up. So when I was coming out of fellowship in uh, 2015, this is sort of the first, uh, the main article that came out about uh, a large series by Dr. Hart about a modified Bowman technique. Uh, and this was using both the transsacral screw fixation as well as some type of graft that uh, goes across uh, the disc base. And uh, you can see here sort of um, a picture of how he has post-op radiographs here. So let's just go through some um, surgical considerations before we get into some cases. So I think preoperatively, we have to look at the lumbopelvic parameters. We know that there's a description by LaBelle and the spondyloformity study group. Um, you have to look at the pelvis, whether it's balanced or unbalanced. This is basically the way they describe whether the patient's retroverting their pelvis. Um, their target number for a kind of a low or a high PT was greater than 25, and we know um, that shifted uh, more recently. And then you have to look at high dysplastic features. So, you know, sacrodoming, a trapezoidal shaped L5, and then whether the sacrum itself had some type of dysplasia or kyphosis. Um, in terms of uh, flexibility films, so I, I do get flexion extension x-rays, but we know this is limited by both, uh, you know, the technician as well as the patient effort. Um, so I do get routinely for this population and preoperative, we get prone lateral x-rays, and I'll show you some examples of that. And the pre-op CT, which gives you a, um, a view through a supine, uh, you can get it on the um, Scott views and get a supine view. I use the most to sort of define your L5 pedicle, uh, your transverse process, which is often small, um, and trying to fuse L5 when you have very small dysplastic L5 pedicle. That was a risk factor for non-union. Um, also uh, through the WashU group, if it's less than two centime uh, square centimeters. And then also looking at your spina bifida occulta. Obviously, 70% uh, of these patients have some spina bifida occulta, but you just wanna make sure there isn't uh, more major midline defects as you're doing your exposure. So intraoperatively, um, just from the last talk with uh, you know, trauma, kyphosis of the sacrum. You can do things positioning. So postural reduction is gonna be your main uh, effort here when it comes to some type of partial reduction uh, and you're not planning a, a full reduction. Um, you do this by extending the hips, flexing the knees, you know, pad placement uh, of your pl uh, along the uh, um, chest and, the, and your thighs. And then you also get this ma mainly through your uh, rod contouring, your compression. Uh, when you're thinking about fusing, uh, fusing and using the technique described by Dr. Hart, I think uh, an L4 to S1 is what we're uh, considering. Um, like we talked about, L5 can be difficult to instrument. Uh, you really need to have uh, excellent screws there, um, and you have to la have large TPs as well as a low slip angle. And then um, when you're doing a transdiscal screw fixation, I think you need to be prepared to do iliac fixation, um, especially if you're unable to adequately get the screws into S1, and I think um, the, when you do the transdiscal screws, this does obviate the need for pelvic fixation because you're getting almost quad cortical fixation, often through bone that's also pretty sclerotic through that uh, intradiscal space. And then when we talk about the uh, Bowman strut graft, so I think uh, uh, we, the orthopedic surgeons are more familiar with ACL reamers, but these are basically just graded, um, you know, uh, uh, reamers that go up in size by half a millimeter. Uh, if you're gonna use a titanium mesh cage, which are commercially available, um, it's a, obviously a non-FDA approved use of that, but usually you undersize that so you get some press fit. Um, and then there's other more modern, probably in, uh, instrumentation options, including some type of compression screw, which I think is uh, wasn't available probably uh, five years ago, or uh, other types of implants that have more um, a triangular type patterns. So we'll go into some case examples. So this is a patient of mine, who was 14 year old Marfan syndrome. He was having severe back pain, some buttock pain, no other major neurologic symptoms. He did have some other um, uh, symptoms associated, uh, phenotypes associated with Marfan syndrome. Uh, but you can see here, preoperatively, um, he has about an 83% slip, so a grade four. Um, his slip angle, he's got about 16 degrees of kyphosis. PI measured about 65. A um, little bit of mismatch, but overall not really sagely malaligned. You can see that he's probably retroverting his pelvis a little bit, as well as um, hypokyphosis of his thoracic spine. Here's his flexion extension views. He doesn't move much. Um, he wasn't giving a, quite a great effort. And then you can see here from a, a standing versus a prone x-rays, you can see that he does have some flexibility um, just based on the prone x-rays. Um, that he goes almost to a neutral position. Uh, this is the CT scan. Um, so he had a pars defect on the left side as well as a dysplastic uh, facet joint. And on the right side, he actually had an intact pars, just a very dysplastic um, pedicle, or sorry, a facet 
Uh, and then here you go on the coronal views, you see he has a large L4TP, but a very diminutive uh, L5TP. So for this patient, we opted to use a modified Bowman technique, um, you know, screws at L4, and then transdiscal screws that go uh, through S1, as well as a titanium mesh graph um, that goes through the intradiscal space. Uh, Postoperatively, we did just posturally get about, you know, a 20% reduction. Um, in slip angle, we measured about a 12 degree uh, lordosis postoperatively. And this is just sort of a progression from pre-op. The pro and x-ray, which helped us to identify that we we're probably able to get adequate postural reduction. And then we did some partial fastectomies on the right side, and then obviously the left side uh, removed that sort of PARS defect. We were able to get a, a, a better reduction just based on that and with uh, our rod contouring or compression. Uh, and this is a final follow-up. It's about two years post-op um, with the fusion. And this is the final case here. So um, this is a 34-year-old female. She's a dependent uh, um, spouse of one of our uh, service members. Severe back pain, having some very intermittent, uh, mild, ridiculous symptoms. She had just gone through all sorts of non-surgical treatments without any relief. She's otherwise healthy. Um, you can see here that she has um, a high-grade spondylolisthesis, uh, some rotational deformity of her, her, her lumbar spine, um, very mild scoliosis. She's a high PI patient, so you can see here 85 degrees of pelvic incidence. Uh, not too much of a lumbar lordosis mismatch. She has this kind of um, very hyperlordotic lumbar spine, um, and her slip angle is about 10 degrees of uh, kyphosis. Flexion extension also didn't show much going on with motion there, but uh, even from a, their standing to her prone x-ray, uh, we could see that she does posturally reduce uh, slightly um, from in that x-ray. Uh, this is her MRI. You can see that she does have some foraminal stenosis, um, which you would expect, as well as sort of that draping of that thecal sac over the sacral dome. Um, and she did have bilateral pars defects, as well as um, these dysplastic facet joints and uh, very sclerotic end plates here. So similar technique that we uh, saw in the last case, so transdiscal screws as well as the um, titanium cage. Um, you can see here, this is just our intraoperative uh, radiographs. And I think um, you can see here just, uh, we did an O-arm spin on uh, this lady just to make sure we had a good position of our screws. And you can see here um, kind of the Final follow-up x-rays here, you can see that we got an adequate reduction. We thought we got about 20 degrees of uh, correction of her slip angle and restoration of her lumbar lordosis. So in conclusion, I think there's some ongoing controversies about high-grade spondylolisthesis, whether you do some type of in situ or partial reduction or a full reduction, uh, certainly the fusion levels and whether you need to fix to the ileum. Also, uh, you know, the techniques that have been described about intradiscal fusions as well as inner body fusions, uh, and whether you need to actually uh, uh, place a screw across the L5S1 disc space. Uh, but I do think that does obviate the need for pelvic fixation. Uh, I think for each of these cases, you have to look at them uh, as very unique. Um, obviously, if they have uh, very dysplastic features, um, that makes it more difficult to probably instrument L5 and understanding their, you know, Lumbo, so, uh, lumbo pelvic parameters to ensure you get an adequate reduction. And hopefully from this talk, you can you know, consider different approaches and uh, techniques. Thank you.